Robert Dijkgraaf is directeur van het Amerikaanse Institute for Advanced Study. Ooit de thuisbasis van Albert Einstein. Dijkgraaf woont op het terrein van deze vrijplaats van de wetenschap. Hij neemt ons mee naar wetenschappers die hun leven wijden aan de wereld van morgen. Denkers, dromers, verkenners, zoekers. Hun kennis verspreidt zich over een wereldwijd netwerk. Als we al die kennis verbinden, wat gaat dat voor ons betekenen? Zijn wij dan het denkende deel van het universum? The mind of the universe. Spelen is niet alleen voor kinderen. Dichters spelen met woorden. Kunstenaars spelen met vorm en kleur. Sporters spelen met hun lichaam. En wetenschappers spelen met ideeën. De bioloog Thomas Huxley verwoordde het ooit heel mooi... De wereld is het schaakbord. De stukken zijn de fenomenen in het universum. De regels van het spel zijn de natuurwetten. En de speler aan de andere kant van de tafel is voor ons verborgen. De natuur, de cultuur, de hele samenleving zit vol met spelregels. Het mooie aan spelen is dat het is gebonden aan regels maar dat het spel nooit hetzelfde verloopt. De mens is een speler. Zo zijn spelletjes de stuwende kracht achter de snelle ontwikkeling van de computer. Games worden steeds ingewikkelder en realistischer... en vragen het uiterste van de computertechnologie. Die spelletjes leveren ook nieuwe wetenschappers op. Eric de Main speelde eindeloos met zijn vader computergames... en dat voedde zijn wiskundige geest. Mede dankzij Pac-Man en Space Invaders werd hij de jongste hoogleraar informatica aan het MIT. Eric de Main en zijn vader bezoeken zo'n beetje elke spelletjesbeurs op zoek naar de nieuwste wiskundige ontwikkelingen op het gebied van computergames. Ja, yeah. pretty epic entrance. Wow. Op zijn achtste gebruikte Eric de Main zijn Game Boy niet meer alleen om spelletjes te doen. Hij bouwde hem om tot een serieuze personal computer. Hij kijkt altijd achter de schermen van het spel. I like the the role playing aspects. I like the um, having fun with friends aspect or exploring a world. But there's always, even when I'm playing just for fun, uh, there's always in the back of my mind thinking, hmm, I wonder if we can set this up as a clean mathematical problem and analyze the complexity of this game. Welke beslissingen nemen mensen en waarom? De wiskunde achter het nemen van beslissingen in spelsituaties staat bekend als de speltheorie en vindt zijn toepassing in de economie, de sociologie en de psychologie. Some games are more amenable to this kind of mathematical analysis. Some of them require some adaptation to be. A lot of games have a lot of different elements. It's really complicated. Mathematics is really good at getting at the core of a problem. So it's a lot better when you have set up a simplified version. Maybe you say, oh, let's just focus in on this one particular aspect of the game, uh, which if that's hard, then the whole thing is, of course, also even harder. De speltheorie geldt niet alleen voor computerspelletjes. Want zelfs achter ganzenbord of men zerg je niet, schuilt een wiskundig universum, gebaseerd op dezelfde wetten. It all fits together. So as I'm playing a game, I'm always thinking about, hmm, I wonder what I could tease out of this game. And as I'm playing and having fun, I'm also trying to think about that, that mathematical formulation. So it's good because then you get inspiration for new problems to solve just by having fun all day. <laughs> I guess my father became a single parent when I was two years old. And so we've been close for a long time, especially from uh, when I was ages 7 to 11, we started traveling together. And that was a really 
fun and bonding experience for us growing up. And also because we were traveling a lot, we tried out homeschool. And homeschool turned out to work really well for us. Um, uh, we, I would spend only like an hour a day doing sort of the breadth of regular school. And so then I'd have many other hours during the day to explore things. And very quickly for me, exploring was uh, computer programming. And so I was sort of voraciously learning about computer programming. And then when school got out, I would go and play with kids and things like that. Vader de Meen kreeg het voor elkaar om zijn zoon al op 12-jarige leeftijd aan de universiteit te laten studeren. Spelenderwijs werd Eric daar professor. Nu stuurt hij een grote groep studenten aan om met de speltheorie oplossingen te vinden voor lastige wiskundige vraagstukken. Spelen is al lang geen spelletje meer. So your king can go down here and shoot up that way or go in the middle. Um, I was wondering, okay. would it be better if the king is always pointing this way? I use it a lot as a way to get uh, students excited about research because most people come in with their own background of like what are fun games and puzzles that they grew up playing and those inspire new uh, mathematical problems either directly about those games or about sort of the underlying principles and uh, these kinds of hardness proofs we call them to show that these games are computationally intractable are a nice way to get started in research because you get to play with the game, you get to use the expertise you have from having grown up playing this game, you've probably spent way too many hours playing them, and that expertise is actually really helpful for solving the underlying math problem. Um, if the king is always pointing the way that it's moving, then I would worry about or maybe accidentally backwards. triggering the next gadget, maybe backward. Um, each of these could be one way to satisfy a clause. But that would require all three of these beams to shoot at the same place. Denktanks van grote bedrijven gebruiken steeds vaker spelen om problemen te analyseren. Maar ook ons dagelijks leven lijkt steeds meer een game te worden. We combineren de werkelijkheid met fictie, zoals bij Pokémon Go. Of we projecteren hele nieuwe werelden direct op ons netvlies met virtual reality brillen. Door haar onderzoek naar virtual reality... werd het laboratorium van computerwetenschapper Carolina Cruz wereldberoemd. Ze is een van de pioniers op dit gebied. Dat let us Oh! And if you, if, you, if you press A twice, you will drop the stapler. Like his oh. face, like oh. he claps. It's like I, I think you put it. I think you put it on his body. <laughs> When I first saw virtual reality in 1991, I had the same experience everybody's having today. You know, the, somebody put some goggles on my face and I start looking around some beautiful world. And of course, I was a young student at the time. I never seen it before. So what did I do? Same as everybody does today. Wow, 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 wow. You know, but like with everything else, after the, the excitement is over, then you start thinking. What is this thing really? You know, what what does and again I'm thinking as an engineer, what is this thing doing for me? Other than just wow. So when I start thinking that, first of all, I was I'm not myself anymore here. Because when I'm in, in, in right here in this room with you, I see my hands, I see my legs, I see a little bit of my hair in here. When I put goggles, I lost all that immediately. I don't know how big something is. I don't know how close something is because I can tell this table is here because I can see my hand going towards that table. So that gives me a sense of a space and relationship. In the virtual world, I'm trying to grab something, but I don't see anything. At the most, I see some floating hand that is not connected to my body and is not even my own hand because most of the virtual environments they give you a male hand, you know, and I'm a woman, I have my little red nails and all that, so it's not even my hand. So I lose myself the moment I work in the virtual space. In het lab van Cruz worden de grenzen van virtual reality opgezocht. Ook haar man is daar onderzoeker. En midden in deze virtuele wereld groeit ook haar zoontje Alexander op. 
Um, he does the same thing that my mom does, and they both do virtual reality. They both do it. What do they do? Virtual reality, I don't remember the word. Oh, just say it one more time. Virtual reality. What makes virtual reality to me an exciting science is that there are no physical rules limiting what we can do. Look back there. What? What? And if we go up to the example of a biologist that is trying to find a cure for a disease, his or her creativity is bound by the laws of physics. No matter how many ideas they can have, at the end of the day, it has to have some sort of molecular bonding, protein something, virus, whatever, DNA something. It has very clear rules of behavior. The nice thing about virtual reality is we don't have that. By the window. Or, oh, there's flying ones. I'm on level two. You're in level two? Yeah, and now this time it's better. This time is better? Why is it better? Look. The limit is what we can imagine, what we can think. We have no physical constraints. The physical world does not constrain what we can do in the virtual reality. I have a six-year-old son, and to me, sometimes watching him in virtual reality opens my own mind sometimes, you know, because his mind is not constrained as my mind is. Because we have, right now, I think we have four generations concurrently living as, as it relates not only to virtual reality, but to technology in general. And again, it's a unique time in history because you know, all the issues related to health and quality of life have been, are the best in human history. So now we have people that are living well into their 80s and 90s having a perfectly functional life. So we have elderly people that have been their entire lives without technology and now in their 60s, 70s, 80s are facing technology. So explain it to Emilio, so Emilio can play this level that Emilio. is easy. We have to shoot the scorpions. You have to do it. Mio! Mio! It, let, me see if they're, let me see if they're coming your way. So when you put those people in virtual reality, is is my best way to describe it is just adorable. It's just adorable. Because they just like they just sit there and they're like, oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> and they just, um, they just don't, they cannot even comprehend what it is that they're looking at, you know. They're very afraid of moving. They just kind of look around and they're like, thank you, dear, but that's it. Mio, Diana. Mio, you're behind. Uh, Let me see. <laughs> He doesn't know anything. I think in our case, we're very fortunate because it's the whole family. <laughs> because my husband is part of the, the same research that I do, you know, and now our son pretty much lives with us in the, in the lab whenever he's not in school, you know. So, so we have an interesting perspective on, on doing this. And, and in some cases, like I say, he, our little son sometimes opens our minds just because we see his frustrations because he expects some things that are not happening, but we didn't even think about them. For Alexander is de virtuele wereld geen spel, maar een werkelijkheid. En zonder dat we doorhebben, zijn wij zelf ook spelers in een dagelijks spel. De economie. Het was de wiskundige John van Neumann die in 1944 ons economisch systeem als een spel beschreef. Een venijnig spel, waarin de kansen niet voor iedereen gelijk zijn. 
De gedragseconoom John List wordt gezien als een goede kandidaat voor de Nobelprijs. Hij probeert de economische wetenschap realistischer te maken door ook psychologische invloeden mee te nemen. Er is een famous quote that millions of people saw apples fall off trees, but Newton asked why. And I think any time you're willing to take the bold step and ask why does something happen, you begin to use your imagination and then you can use science to explore the whys behind our big scientific questions that we face today. Waarom handelen we zoals we handelen? En hoe wordt ons handelen beïnvloed? Als gedragseconoom observeert John List het spel wereldwijd. Hij probeert de spelers die regels aan te reiken waarmee ze allemaal van het spel kunnen profiteren. Make yourself champions, guys. Make yourself champions. Then up right, right away up. Hey, 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 hey. List experimenteert door sommige spelregels aan te passen. En kijk dan hoe het gedrag van mensen, of eigenlijk de spelers, verandert. Markets have always fascinated me. Things like how are prices determined in markets. You know, when I was a little kid, we would pay a quarter for a pack of baseball cards. And I wondered, why is it a quarter? Why isn't it 50 cents? Why isn't it a dime? And those types of questions always... Uh, piqued my curiosity in thinking about how do markets not only price goods, but how do they allocate goods and services to people. These are a few of the sports cards that I was trading. These are from 1981. And some of these cards are valued. These are probably smaller valued cards, maybe $25 to $50. This card is worth $20,000. This is the best card known to mankind. It's uh, called a Mint 9. So this is one of my favorite cards from when I was a kid. He was one of my boyhood heroes. And I picked this up through buying, selling, and trading in the market. This is how I learned to think through markets, to think through how we can change markets to see how people respond. And it ends up that these things are worth a lot of money now. So. What will I do with these? I hope my kids use these to learn about economics themselves. My kids have started to collect as well. I don't give them these cards, not until I'm, uh, I pass to the next life. Mm. But um, these are a glimpse of my boyhood. These are how I learned to be a scientist. As I grew older through high school and when I was in college, I began to be uh, a dealer in these markets. So what a dealer does is a dealer brings his or her sports cards to the market and then sells them or trades them to people. And what you could readily see is that not all people were, were getting the same deal. Um, some people would pay a lot more money than another person. And even in those types of markets, you could see the inequities that were arising. And I always thought, What are the factors that, that are causing those inequities in markets and what can we do within a free market system to lessen those inequities or make markets more fair? My field experiments range all the way from experiments in firms like Uber to Citibank to Amazon.com. A lot of charities want to raise more money. I help them using field experiments that leverage behavioral economics. I go to schools to help young kids. I go to schools to help teachers. So when you think about it, kind of the world is my lab and I'm running field experiments all over the world. Mensen reageren vaak sterker op verlies dan op winst van dezelfde omvang. Hierdoor ontstaat een angst om te verliezen waardoor men niet meer verder speelt en het spel stagneert. Verlies aversie. The major reason why markets work is because people trade. You have people who trade by definition, the seller gains and the buyer gains through a trade. So if we can 
contemplate why there's a lack of trading in markets. And we can figure out why doesn't the market work the way it should. We can then design incentives to get people to trade more in markets. What we find is that there is not enough trading in markets or the market gains are smaller than they should be because of loss aversion. So what can we do to make the market function more appropriately? My argument is you have to give them a sense of overcoming loss aversion. So you have to give them trades and give them, let's say, free trades, so to speak. And once people trade and trade and trade, they don't have loss averse preferences anymore. So that's how we can use it to make markets better. So we have to change the rules somehow? Or? I think if we somehow change the rules to make people want to trade more when they first enter a market, the market can be more efficient in the end. That's right. Cultuurhistoricus Johan Huizinga noemde ons homo ludens, de spelende mens. Hij zag het spel als de stuwende kracht achter onze cultuur. Of zoals hij in zijn boek uit 1938 zegt... Het spel slaat om in ernst en de ernst in het spel. Het spel kan zich verheffen tot hoogte van schoonheid en heiligheid. De orde die het spel oplegt is absoluut. De geringste afwijking daarvan bederft het spel, ontneemt het zijn karakter en maakt het waardeloos. Wiskundigen zijn dol op spelletjes, op puzzels, problemen oplossen binnen afgebakende speelruimte en een eigen orde. Right, so if you're just doing one letter or if it's if you start a word here, this part's cut off. Eigenlijk zijn Eric en zijn vader een soort codekrakers. Wat is de code achter origami? Hoe zijn de wetmatigheden van deze vouwkunst te benutten en toe te passen in nieuwe technieken? I was a a beginning graduate student at the University of Waterloo and my father remembered an old uh, unsolved problem that he had read about years ago uh, and the concept is you take a piece of paper you fold it flat and make one complete straight cut and then unfold the pieces and magicians like Houdini could produce a five-pointed star or lots of different uh, simple shapes and what are the limits can you make anything by this process or what can you do And so that's the problem we started working on. Okay, I've got geometry and algorithms now. Uh, this seems like a cool unsolved problem to work on. And it turned out to be fairly challenging. It took us a year or two to solve. Uh, but it also was very exciting uh, that we got our first universality result. We showed that you can make any polygon, any shape made out of straight sides, or actually you can make several shapes all at once just by one straight cut after folding. You know, we're studying the mathematics of a magic trick. How could that be useful for anything, though it turned out to be unexpectedly. I originally got interested in origami because uh, it just posed a lot of interesting mathematical questions. You have this sheet of material, and you have very simple rules, you can't stretch it and you can't tear it, and what can you do just by reconfiguration, just by folding? Right. So it's kind of a simple setup, but the answers turn out to be surprisingly complicated, and you need to use a lot of powerful geometry and algorithms to figure out what you can fold. You can really fold anything and finding more interesting ways to make structures that fold between different shapes also has a lot of practical applications in science and medicine and engineering where you want to build some kind of structure that can cha transform its shape from one thing to another. If you want to put something into space, you want to fold it small so it fits inside your space shuttle and then you can unfold it when it gets there. One area is um, protein folding. So every living thing that we know of in this world is built up out of lots of little proteins kind of making life happen. 
and proteins are essentially one-dimensional pieces of paper that coil up into complicated 3D structures, and that 3D structure kind of determines how it interacts with other proteins and what, what its function is. And we don't really understand that process of, of folding kind of a one-dimensional strip of paper into uh, these, these 3D structures, how nature does it, how we could do it. You could imagine some disease comes along, new disease, you could design a protein to fight specifically that disease. Uh, but we don't know how to design proteins that fold the way we want to. And so we're trying to understand how proteins fold in order to sort of just understand how biology is functioning, but also so that we can kind of control it in useful ways and kill viruses and things like that. Basic research tends to become useful eventually. Uh, even though you may not see the applications ahead of time. In mathematics, there are just a lot of basic questions that are very curious and you want to know the answer to. And if they're basic enough, very simple setup like paper folding, very few rules about what's, what you're allowed to do, and yet it's very complicated to understand. But there's many different ways you might formulate what you want to fold sort of the classic uh, origami design problem is, is shape design. I say, I give you a three-dimensional shape, I want to fold that thing. Uh, what's a good way to fold that thing? And we're still finding good algorithms for that. We have some general procedures that work, but they may not be so efficient. So this one, I can't tell. It looks like it might even be a whole, there's room for a whole pixel there. So like some of them are pretty hard to do an N. Um, so we especially like to prove what we call universality results, where we say in this kind of origami design or folding design, you can make anything you want, and we give you a computer algorithm to do that. And so you can come in with your specifications like, oh, I'd like something that looks like this, and, it, and the algorithm will give you how to fold exactly that thing. So then that comes, whoa. Yeah, this is scary to unfold. <laughs> Yeah, this one has a lot of folds too, too. Mm -hmm. you do that. Al spelend verkennen we de mogelijkheden van de werkelijkheid binnen de orde van de spelregels. Als een kind in de beschermde omgeving van de zandbak. Zolang je daar binnen blijft, mag je doen wat je wilt. De orde van de zandbak. Maar virtual reality gaat nog veel verder. Het maakt nieuwe werelden. Je kunt spelen met de tijd. Of je kunt je verplaatsen in andere culturen. Je kunt zelfs je eigen persoon ontvluchten. En een andere identiteit aannemen. I have spent my entire life in thousands of different realities, experiences, worlds. I've been in 15th century India, for example, and I have participated in some religious ritual that doesn't happen anymore. We have been into the future and trying to figure out how life in Mars is going to be. Carl, if you look up, you'll see the drone. Ah, there it is. I had gone down inside a, a plant cell and I actually traveled inside a water molecule and see photosynthesis from the inside. You know, so to me, it's really cool. It's really exciting. We also have done some work related to stress and depression. And, and again, creating this alternate reality that for a short period of time, you become a very famous singer, a very wealthy person, a famous explorer going somewhere, you know, a lobster, you know, <laughs> whatever your fantasy is, you know. Just, just 10, 15 minutes exposure to that type of alternate reality significantly decreases stress levels and depressions. Oh, yeah. Now we can move. For many of the worlds that we do, they actually become very real to the people that experience those worlds. I think it's going to be interesting to see your son's unrestricted mind. 
his mind is somewhere else that I cannot go there. I'm too constrained with my own knowledge of the technology to, to let me go there, where he doesn't care. You know, we just got some recent equipment in our laboratory, and he mastered that equipment before any of our graduate students. And watching him using that particular equipment, it was absolutely amazing. I mean, he doesn't even know how to read. Het begin van een toekomst die we ons nu nog niet kunnen voorstellen. Wat doet het met je als je van jongs af aan kunt rondkijken in een molecuul? Of kunt reizen door een melkwegstelsel? Net zo vanzelfsprekend als een wandeling in een bos. All right, so I want to show you the last things that we've done. Okay. So you can um, take a look and see what you think. Because that's what we are right now. So one of the main things we've done, that, and I think you haven't seen this yet, is we have improved the visual quality. So well, now you see. This is wonderful. See. You know, I remember my, my first cadaver. And had I been able to do this with a cadaver, it would have been so much more enriched learning experience. You know, uh, they're messy and they're smelly. In fact, when you work on a cadaver that has been infused with formaldehyde, the, the clothing you work with, you, you got to leave it in, in a locker that's, that's going to be aired out later on because you can't go walking around the city with those clothing. So this eliminates that. This is going to change healthcare education for all of us. There's no doubt that doesn't want to stay, so let's go like this. I'm pretty convinced that we're living in one of those human history changing times, you know, that right now we don't see it because we're living it, but I think generations into the future, you know, maybe 200 years from now, 300 years from now, people might be referring to this time as the virtual reality revolution, like the industrial revolution and the information revolution. I think we are at a point that what we are doing, I think is going to change our world as we know it. It's going to change how we live as humans and how I, we identify ourselves as humans. And of course, we don't know it because we're living it right now. Nieuwe werkelijkheden onderzoeken. Dat is ook wat John List doet. Het spel van de wereldeconomie hapert. Regelmatig worden de regels overtreden en er wordt zelfs vals gespeeld. Ons eigen gedrag is onderdeel van de spelregels en dat maakt het zo lastig. De psychologie van de mens verstoort de orde van de economie. I wanted to be an active participant in a market and go and generate my own data and generate my own data for a reason to test economic theory and then to change the world about a specific policy. Why do people discriminate? Why do people give to charitable causes? Why do inner city schools continue to fail? These big scientific and social questions are what I want to go after. And I want to change the rules of the game and collect my own data and generate my own data to answer these questions. John List doet zijn onderzoek gewoon op straat. En vooral in die typische achterstandswijken die in elke stad te vinden zijn. Hij neemt ons mee naar Chicago Heights. Daar wonen veel verliezers van het economische spel. Chicago Heights is about 45% African American and 45% Hispanic. But this area down here is nearly a, a completely African American area. The city is very divided and segregated along racial lines. But about 95% of kids in Chicago Heights are on food stamps. The economics starts with jobs. It starts with a community that has lost a massive amount of jobs because its manufacturing base has declined. In the moment that the jobs leave, you end up having a an economic market or a community that, that is desperate. I don't think we've wasted this much human potential since the Dark Ages. 
because kids are not receiving proper education, that's a crime. That's a real crime. And it's because we have not been serious about using field experiments in the classroom to learn about what works and why. Our experiments with students is the morning of the test, when they enter the room where they take the test, we announce to them, here's $20. If you perform better than you did on your last test, you can keep the $20. If you don't perform better, we will take the $20 away. (laughs) Those students significantly increase their test scores in an amount that you cannot even imagine compared to people who we tell them, we will give you $20 if you perform well. Amaria and Chucky. Quiet down for me, okay? I told you guys we'll have a special guest, okay? This is Professor Liss, okay? He's the department chair of economics at the University of Chicago, okay? So definitely give him your full attention, please. Um, has a great background, has done a lot of good things, and uh, please give me your undivided attention, okay? Thank you, thank you. So I was raised in a community exactly like this one. My dad was a truck driver, and my mom was a secretary, and I never imagined that I would end up as the chairman of the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. The reason why is because I never thought that somebody from my community could actually make it to a job like that. I figured people really didn't care about what I thought or what I did. A lot of you are probably feeling the same way, that people really don't care about your outcomes. People don't care if you're going to be able to make it. A lot of you think I probably will never be able to make it. You're smiling. What do you think? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You really have to think about the decisions you make in life and in school, because like what we do now is going to judge what what we're going to do later. Absolutely. A lot of you are thinking right now, I have to do homework. It's a, it's a cost to get up every day and go to school and the benefits are not accruing until far into the future. I have to work really hard now and I don't get the higher, the more money till very, very many, many, many years. That's, that's a hard proposition to take because it's the cost is right now, the time and effort right now, but the benefits not for 20 years but I promise you, it'll be worth it. In 20 years, when all of you have made it, I want you to come back to me and say, whenever I talk about adding incentives to education, people find that repugnant. They think it's it's something that's not necessary because we should be doing education for the sake of learning, people say. But unfortunately, in these communities, People do not have the intrinsic motives just to go through education because they want to, because they believe in it. Het idee om iemand te belonen voordat hij of zij een prestatie heeft geleverd, blijkt heel goed te werken. Leerlingen presteren veel beter, want het feit dat ze iets kwijt kunnen raken, is een veel sterkere prikkel dan een beloning achteraf. Dat is de verliezerversie. Touch and hold the blue. Now you're going to try. Keep your eyes on the star. Answer as fast as you can without making mistakes. Touch the blue and I'll walk you through. There you go. Good job. Now we've done this also in other venues too. We've gone to China and we've looked at Chinese manufacturing workers and we've used the exact same incentive scheme. We've said at the beginning of the week, here's a bonus, and if you work hard, on Friday you can keep that bonus. And we compare that to the idea that work hard all week will give you a bonus on Friday. The loss of version one works a lot better. And in fact, we did the one in China over a six month period, over all six months, the manufacturing workers worked harder when they were getting the bonus up front. Right now, the economic game is illogically unfair, and we are leaving human potential on the sidelines because everyone's not given a fair chance. So what I'm talking about is setting up 
the economic incentives in setting up the economic game so everyone has a chance to win. Who knows, one of those kids right there could be the next U.S. president if they're given a chance. De economie is een chaotisch spel, moeilijk te doorgronden. We zijn pionnen in ons eigen spel. En alles wat ons mens maakt, maakt het onvoorspelbaar. Hi everybody. So how many of you are going to be working in video games when you are grown-ups and all that? A lot of you? Spelen wordt steeds belangrijker in onze cultuur. Het is serieus geworden en de stuwende kracht achter nieuwe technologie. So we're going to show you a lot of things, but before we show you things, I have a very important question for everybody. Why did you guys did this camp? What is so exciting about doing video games and the kinds of things that we do, which is virtual reality? What do you guys think is... Um, oh, lots of fans. Well, it's because that we can let our imagination run loose and see what we can actually create in, in virtual reality or video, in the video game world. That's a very good answer because that's exactly what I tell all my students. You have to have a big imagination. Like with every new science, there is always the positive part that the science brings to society and some of the potential dangers that can bring into society. And, and certainly there is a, a concern that we might create this alternate reality to some extent that is better than our real reality and we might all start living more those alternate realities and how we're going to handle that. And that at this moment, we are, I think, so early on what we are doing that I don't think none of us has a very good, um, I don't know how to say, understanding or picture of how all this is going to happen. with an issue. Uh-oh. That one definitely has an issue. So out of all the areas that we've checked, this one looks like it needs help. So doctor, are you ready to perform? Uh, how do I perform? <laughs> I can actually do things in here. Right now we're just starting. Our own knowledge today constrains sometimes so we can think. And the new generations that that knowledge is a matter of fact. It's not a discovery anymore. Then they can take it to the next level. Same as we did from the previous generations from us. De natuurkunde probeert de spelregels van het universum te ontdekken. De regels van de werkelijkheid. In de wiskunde kun je je eigen regels verzinnen. De enige vraag is, levert het ook een interessant en eerlijk spel op? De economie is een meedogeloos spel en bepaalt je lot in deze wereld. Een wereld waarin voortdurend vals wordt gespeeld. Eigenlijk is John List een coach, een trainer voor de toekomstige spelers in het economische spel, zodat ze succesvoller zullen zijn. When you look at the way our economy is set up, the highest paying jobs are the ones that are the most competitive. They're the ones that you build your way up the pyramid, and then when you're at the top, it's highly competitive because your firm is competing against another firm that is ultra competitive. And the world is a place of competition, but my argument is that if we can set up the wage schemes in the rules of the game in a way in which we recognize that society is handicapping certain types of people, if we set up the rules of the game at the entry level, this can systematically affect where these two types of people go in the long run in markets. Three things on the baseball field this weekend. What are the three things, Mac? Uh, have fun. Have fun. All right, second thing. 
Colton. Don't cry. Don't cry. Third thing. Try hard. Try hard. If we do those, we're winners, right? I don't care about outputs. What I care about is inputs. All right? On three alphas. One, two, three! Alpha! Every generation is a new mindset. So yeah, I mean, these are the new minds of the new universe. Because the new universe is not going to be only the universe as we know it today with the planets and the galaxies and all the beautiful formations. It's a completely limitless universe because it's going to come out of our imagination. In Alice in Wonderland zegt de kat op een gegeven moment tegen Alice... Verbeelding is het enige wapen in de strijd tegen de realiteit. Maar wat als onze verbeelding realiteit wordt? Als we spelenderwijs de oude werkelijkheid veranderen in een nieuwe. Een spel zonder grenzen. Als we leven in een universum met oneindig veel werkelijkheden... Ook dat is de mind of the universe. Iedereen kan de complete interviews van de mind of the universe downloaden via de website. Ontdek unieke fragmenten die je niet zag in deze uitzending. Of creëer je eigen programma. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If so, you can find the next one on this website. If you're interested in other recommended series, please check out our channel. If you want to stay informed about new projects and series, please subscribe to our channel.